it's it's weighted so heavily in favor, not in favor of, but the emphasis on uh, number one Los Alamos, and then Oak Ridge, and th then Hanford uh, as the three secret cities or something. But uh, the fact is that uh, uh, the Met Lab at Chicago was enormously important. The Stag Field reactor was historic, and uh, in '42 it's sort of dismissed. Uh, the all the uh, chemistry at uh, on plutonium that went into the uh, major processing designs at uh, Hanford was developed in the Met Lab at Chicago, transmitted to DuPont and put into the design of Hanford. A lot of the reactor design, Eugene Wigner was working at Chicago and uh, dealing with the DuPont people. And uh, the DuPont people lived side by side with the people at Chicago getting what they needed. <clears throat> so Chicago was the focus of uh, a great deal, including the Oak Ridge pile design that started producing the first visible amounts of plutonium at uh, at Oak Ridge, and the techniques for uh, analyzing it and uh, separating it and and uh, bringing it back to Chicago. The all that plutonium was brought back to Chicago, and and uh, first visible amounts of plutonium then were were uh, significantly visible amounts were from the Oak Ridge operation. And uh, so all of that preceded, in effect, uh, the Los Alamos effort. And uh, I've always thought of Los Alamos as being a uh, small part of the program. <clears throat> and would have been obvious until they discovered spontaneous fission in plutonium-240, which meant they had to suddenly invent something. <laughs> Up to then, it was a gun assembly, and uh, there was just no great, great need for invention. It was uh, it was the final test of whether there would be an explosion, and therefore the most spectacular, but probably the one with the most assured outcome. So, history is to me has been sort of lopsided <laughs> because it fixes on the spectacular aspects. But uh, the initial design <coughs> by, <coughs> by Fermi, the Fermi graphite lattice reactor, which seems obvious now, wasn't obvious because the Germans never attempted it. Uh, they thought in terms of a heavy water reactor, which was much more ambitious, required a much bigger industrial effort, uh, and was less achievable. And I believe that counterintelligence, particularly in the part of the British, did everything they could to promote the notion in Germany that you couldn't do it except with heavy water. And... Uh, And that's what the the Germans uh, believed. Uh, so unless they could make large amounts of heavy water, uh, the pile production of lots of uranium of plutonium uh, didn't seem achievable. And of course, producing enriched U two thirty five was a massive industrial effort. And would have been bombed out of existence unless we're all underground in uh, in Germany. So that de shaped history, the history of the project in Germany. In my mind, not the reluctance of uh, Heisenberg or anybody to undertake it. It just looked impossible to them. But the graphite lattice reactor was a brilliant invention. It uh, was carefully designed to permit fast neutrons to get out of the fuel elements and slow down 
in graphite and diffused back as thermal neutrons into the uranium. Why it didn't occur apparently to anybody but Fermi, I don't know, because it does, like so many brilliant inventions, it seems obvious after, after the fact. And uh, Eugene Wigner, I guess that he's mentioned in these uh, these uh, uh, your outline, was uh, really one of the brilliant contributors to uh, making the Fermi reactor practical. He, in fact, as one of the famous stories is that. Uh, Um, about the Wigner disease and uh, uh, how he designed against that. But uh, when the Hanford reactor started up, they discovered also they did that xenon, one of the isotopes, was tremendous poison and shut the reactor down again. But they'd over-designed it. That was what DuPont had done. They, without knowing what was going to go wrong, they produced a sufficient overdesign of the Hanford reactor to be able to put in extra uh, fuel elements and, uh, and compensate for the, uh, for the uh, xenon poisoning. So that was an extremely important aspect. Uh, and also the surprising fact that The neutron capture in uranium-238, which is a poison, fissile isotope as U-235, uh, was anomalously low. And if it had been as high as it is in most heavy elements, there wouldn't have been any uh, natural Fermi reactor. There wouldn't have been any plutonium program unless it had been based on enriching U-235 and uranium to what they presently do in power reactors, up to 3%, then they could have built a chain reacting pile and made plutonium, but that would have been an unlikely thing. So except for that, <clears throat> unlikely event that uranium-238 capture was low, uh, there would have been no fat boy. There would have been what thin man and the uh, the gun assembly of U two thirty five. And uh, so there's some remarkable things that, as though nature had provided a path, smooth a path to uh, making bombs easier than they should have been. What do you want me to uh, talk about? Talk about? Your, how you got involved in the Manhattan Project? <coughs> well, I had remarkable good luck when I got my bachelor's degree in 1941. My physics teacher, I'd majored in chemistry. My physics teacher thought I ought to be a physicist, and he was a good friend of Eugene Wigner's. They both had emigrated from Europe. And he said that Wigner had been in touch with him and they needed somebody who knew chemistry and could work with physicists and I should go down and talk with Wigner. And I did. And uh, after he quizzed me for a while, I'd been off to the library looking up some stuff. He asked me to join his group and that meant doing some graduate work at Princeton and working with his group on the... Uh, cyclotron <clears throat> based on his description of some of their problems and my early interest in the possibility of a chain reaction in uranium after the discovery of fission uh, I gathered that they were working on what they were working on and uh, was very eager to join them and did. And I was the chemist, it turned out. I had to, uh, they very soon went on uh, three shifts, seven days a week, and I slept beside the cyclotron because I had to be available. And 
when these bombardments, and the job was to measure the neutron capture cross-section and above room temperature, the epithermal capture cross-section and uranium-238 of the neutrons, because if it was as predicted, it would have made the Fermi pile impossible. And it turned out the pile was possible and was successful. And uh, co we all went to uh, Chicago in May of 1942, and uh, I was assigned to Herb Anderson, Fermi's group. And uh, working with whatever Herb Anderson asked me to do, which was a number of things, <clears throat> including um, purifying uranium from fission products, which I did at Princeton, which involved large amounts of ether, which was both explosive if you handled it improperly and highly inflammable. Nobody had paid attention to those things in those days, and uh, so we worked in mm, conditions that would be considered totally unacceptable <laughs> now for that kind of thing. Uh, and machining beryllium, beryllium oxide. Uh, Herb Anderson got beryllosis doing that. Fortunately, I didn't. Making radium, uh, beryllium neutron sources. The beryllium was poisonous. The radium was enormously radioactive. We did that by hand, essentially. Uh, eventually, I would go to New York to the Radium Corporation of America, which did the same thing in an office building in Sixth Avenue. You couldn't imagine doing that now. In fact, that building was so radioactive, the roof was so radioactive where the radon came out that uh, it blasted my survey meter. I went back to work down there and never said anything about it. Uh, there's. <laughs> I don't know how long it lasted in the middle of New York City on 6th Avenue, but uh, I've never heard any mention of it. <laughs> Radium Corporation of America just did what it chose. And nobody worried about those things at that time. Uh, and then, of course, there was uh, Oak Ridge. I was sent down there when it started making plutonium because they couldn't agree on how much plutonium they were making, and I was a referee, I guess. I still don't know whose methods they used, but I cast my vote, and uh, after a couple of months, I left and came back to Chicago. And then the big problem was making sure that the plutonium that was delivered to uh, Los Alamos was so pure that... Uh, there was no neutron background in it from alpha particles from plutonium hitting light elements, which made neutrons. And that would have produced a pre-implosion in a gun assembly. Then they discovered that the same thing happened in plutonium-240 from spontaneous fission, so they couldn't do a gun assembly. So our job was essentially over purifying plutonium and at that point, some colonel called me, or he came to Chicago, actually, from Los Alamos. I don't know who it was. I can't think of his name. But he, I was on his list, and he said, you've got to go to Los Alamos. And same time, I was talking with John Dunning from Columbia, who ran the uh, all the research on the gaseous diffusion, uh, the, the Oak Ridge gas it was developed at Columbia. And there were major offices of Kellex and so forth uh, running that program in downtown Manhattan. Uh, and John Dunning said, well, come work with me. And I guess that his name was sufficient to impress who, Colonel or whoever. I went to New York instead of Los Alamos. I would have gone to Los Alamos if some friend had called me and said I had to come, but I was... Still a civilian and not impressed by the colonel's authority. Uh, and actually, it was a wonderful stay at Columbia because 
I was working with Madam Wu and Jim Rainwater and that group. They both won Nobel Prizes. And uh, I learned from Eugene Wigner at Princeton and from Bob Wilson when he was at Princeton and from, I don't know, there were seven or eight Nobel laureates eventually and the remarkable people that I got to associate with. And I learned how real science is done. And uh, it affected my career. And uh, I feel that I, again, that I was extremely lucky to uh, deal those people. And also, I got the notion that scientists collaborated readily with one another, that there were never any proprietary arguments, that everybody was totally focused and everybody knew what the mission was. And at the end of the war, I discovered that wasn't so. It was the war and the threat that Hitler would achieve an atomic bomb, which everybody believed early on that they were way ahead and should have been. But uh, <clears throat> uh, it turned out it wasn't true. But nevertheless, the threat makes these remarkable people who generally run their own show work in an orchestrated pattern and the moment that threat is gone, they exploded all over the country, each to his own fiefdom and his own uh, specialty. And uh, c keeping Los Alamos going turned out to be a major problem. They had to recruit fresh people. At that point, I got an urgent phone call from my friends in Los Alamos to uh, go there, so I left Columbia and I went there to see what was going on. I happened there was a pretty chemist that I knew at the University of Chicago who'd gone there. So I married her and took her back east with me as soon as I could. Actually, I first of all went over cro overseas to Operation Crossroads, which was the first military test of uh, um, atomic bomb against Navy ships. And, that was, uh, gave birth to the famous picture of kind of a wedding cake coming out of the Bikini Lagoon with battleships poised on top of it. Uh, that was their underground water uh, uh, explosion of a bomb. And then there was an air burst. And so there were two tests in Operation Crossroads, and uh, I participated in both of them on the when that famous wedding cake picture was taken, I was on B-17, about three miles away, with a photographer who took that picture. And then when the shockwave hit us, he fell out the door, but he was strapped in, and we pulled him back in. He and his equipment were strapped in, so <coughs> we had to rush over. I was the only one without an oxygen mask. We were at oxygen required, but I was a civilian, and... Uh, Everybody else was Air Force. <laughs> They'd forgotten to provide an oxygen mask for me, but that was okay. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't call very heavily on the photographer. <laughs> I was having a tough time breathing. <coughs> <coughs> but I do remember that we took a uh, many Gs, positive and negative shock, which would have torn the wings off most airplanes, but a B-17 was a remarkable aircraft, and uh, I can see why it survived so much uh, anti-aircraft flak and stuff and uh, bombing raids over Germany. And then came back from Crossroads, as I say, got married and finished my graduate work uh, at Carnegie Mellon, which was then Carnegie Tech. Uh, and was asked to come back to Los Alamos when I got my degree. And I was interviewed by uh, various people and did come back to the uh, radiochemistry group. And three weeks after I came back, the Russians exploded their first atomic bomb, Joe 1. And uh, some samples were collected with a highly secret uh, 
operation going on in the Air Force, uh, and the samples were some samples were delivered to Los Alamos under such secrecy that the director and R.S. Bradbury didn't know they were there. Uh, I remember the guy that showed up wearing a trench coat, just like in the movies, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and then after that. The job was to persuade the people in Washington that this was a bomb and not a reactor that had blown up. And that's not an easy thing to do with people who don't know what the physics and nuclear chemistry are. Uh, as it turns out, it's very easy to do enough fission products since they have different half-lives, and you know what they should have been at time zero to distinguish between a reactor which generates its fission products over a long period of time and one which generates its fission products all instantaneously. The profile of fission product distribution is entirely different. And in fact, you can set the time that the thing, the explosion happened almost precisely from just... Uh, following the decay curves back to a common time of origin. The um, argument then was finally accepted by Mr. Truman that it was a bomb. Edward Teller at that time argued very convincingly, as I recall, that they probably did it with heavy water. He didn't know they'd simply gotten the design by espionage of a graphite lattice reactor. Total design transmitted to them. So they didn't do a heavy water reactor. They didn't make that much heavy water. But he argued that since they had that much deuterium, they could easily make an enriched thermonuclear device so they could go quickly to a thermonuclear bomb once they had because they had all that deuterium. Well, they didn't have all that deuterium, but uh, they'd, they'd done, done it the same way we did. And uh, nevertheless, we very quickly went on a uh, six-day week, 48 hours. Actually, it was seven days since we never stopped working uh, to design the first thermonuclear device. That was the big problem then. And it really went on an accelerated basis early 1950 and terminated in 52. So it was less than two years from authorizing it to the first test of a major thermonuclear device. And just a few months later, the um, Russians did something called Joe 4, which was also thermonuclear. But it, they did exactly what Teller had predicted, except they took all the deuterium they had, essentially, and put it into a device in which they were burning. They took all the, I'm sorry, they took all the tritium they had. Um, you make tritium with extra neutrons on lithium-6, and... Uh, that was that was Teller's argument was that they would be making a lot of tritium, not deuterium. I misspoke. They took all the tritium they had and burned DT, D, a DT reaction, deuterium plus tritium, which was much easier to do than a what we call a real thermonuclear reaction, which is burning deuterium without the tritium. The uh, that was what Ivy Mike was. That was the November. 52 thermonuclear, U.S. thermonuclear test. Uh, then it was all a Cold War. The, uh, uh, the 50s were the Cold War race between um, Russia and the United States, which the most remarkable thing to my, in my mind was the uh, test of a 60 megaton device that the Russians did and uh, 
I never understood it. It had no military use at all. It was by far the biggest explosion that had ever been done. And they announced it in advance, in effect, make sure that nobody missed it. But uh, not too many years later, I got to the Kremlin in Moscow and saw their big brass cannon, which they had, they were tremendous metallurgists in the early Middle Ages. And they made this huge brass cannon, which would have killed everybody around it if it ever been fired. But instead they brought in all the all the uh, members of the uh, Russian power elite from the countryside and showed them this huge cannon which made them tremble. And uh, so it was uh, seeing that brass cannon that made me realize that 60 megaton uh, device was their modern equivalent of the uh, brass cannon in the Kremlin. It's the way they think. They think in terms of uh, power I, and its symbols uh, much more um, innovatively than people in Washington do. They think of military power, which is being demonstrated right now, and, and, uh, and it's overwhelming coercive nature, whereas the Russians thought in terms of symbols. We're being criticized by using symbols badly. <laughs> we always have. Um, and after the uh, after the uh, essentially the cessation of nuclear testing uh, Los Alamos went on to other things, but uh, your history, I think, is one that stops with uh, with the development of military weapons. Is that correct? I think so. I don't know. I don't know what else to uh, reminisce about. There are lots of interesting things that were happened personally to me. I mean, meeting Edward Teller and Leo Zillard, uh, the head of much of the French program, von Halben, who was spirited out of France after the Germans conquered France. He was picked up by the British and somewhere on the Riviera and brought to England. And he was bringing with him all the heavy water that uh, existed in France, put it in an open touring car, put a blanket over it, put his kids on top of it, went through a number of checkpoints. <clears throat> and he described the experience to me. Uh, and of course, I met people at Princeton too. Dick Feynman was one of the first people I met. Everybody has a Dick Feynman story. He, came in the office I'd just been assigned. He didn't expect to find anybody there. He said, oh, he said, may I use your phone? I said, sure, and he whipped out a little screwdriver, took it apart, and left with a piece of the telephone. And I was looking at the pieces on the desk, and that night I met him at uh, an eating club that I just was told to join, and that's the way you ate dinner in Princeton. And Dick was sitting opposite me, and I said, are you through with my phone? And he said, oh, yes. And he came in the next morning and put it back together and left. But at the cyclotron, there was a sign that said, don't let Dick Feynman and he steals tools. So I was not the first person that he'd victimized, obviously. I'd learned later to listen carefully to everything he said. It's all fascinating. Again, learning how science is really done. Uh, well, my story about Arthur Hawley Compton is, number one, of course, he was Carl Compton's brother. They were both highly distinguished. It was fun talking with him. <clears throat> uh, when I was asked to go to Oak Ridge to settle an, help settle an argument about how much plutonium they were making, uh, 
I was told to get down there as fast as possible. And uh, right away I started getting phone calls from Oak Ridge from my friends saying, bring all the booze you can uh, because it was a dry community. And when you bought booze from bootleggers, it cost two or three times more than buying it in a liquor store. So I packed a suitcase full of bottles of rye and they were hard to get actually, but uh, because whisk good whiskey wasn't that available either, especially scotch and during the war. And then I packed my own suitcase, so I had two suitcases and got on the train. I had a berth and Arthur Holly Compton had suddenly gotten on it and was running, rushing down there, but nobody had been able to get him a berth. I offered him mine, but uh, he slept that night in the chair seat, I think. Anyway, when we got to Oak Ridge, uh, there's a place where they can stop, which they don't usually, but it's close to, uh, the train goes to Knoxville, but this was close to uh, Oak Ridge. And he invited me to get off there and help me with my bags. He immediately picked up this thing full of booze, which tinkled back and forth, and he looked at it. He said, I'll take care of this. So he handed it carefully to a chauffeur who put it in the trunk, and two of us rode into Oak Ridge, and uh, he told the guy to be very careful with the, with the suitcase with the booze. And of course, I was greeted by all my friends waiting to <laughs> divvy it up. So that was uh, my closest collaboration with <laughs> Arthur Holly Compton. He was a very kind, human, um, thoughtful person. And you said you knew Szilard? Hmm? Did you know Leo Szilard? Yes, I had... Leo Szilard was uh, somebody I really got to know when he presided over things at the DuPont Plaza, which was on DuPont Circle. When we started going to Washington, trying to persuade the Truman people that, uh, well, there was immediately something called the Beta Panel, which Hans Beta presided over, which is still never been widely publicized. It was highly secret, but it was, the euphemism was it was followed foreign technology. Actually, it was designed to look at all the possible intelligence aspects concerning Russian nuclear weapons activities. So we went to Washington regularly and stayed at the DuPont Plaza, which was where Leo Szilard stayed and joined them for breakfast in the morning, that kind of thing. And uh, so I, that's the way I got to know Leo Szilard. I met him initially at at Princeton in 1951 or 41 or 42. And that was when Edward Teller would show up and uh, and they would start talking Hungarian and I thought I'd have to learn Hungarian. Uh, Wigner, Teller, Zillard. Uh, but uh, I never did learn much Hungarian. <laughs> the uh, the one Halbin story was to me uh, a great story, and there was also more than one fire. The uh, Princeton group decided it needed as much metallic uranium as it could get to do some neutron absorption measurements on metallic uranium. It turned out the only place that made it was a place called metallic, called metal hydrides, I believe. It was in Beverly, Massachusetts, 
And uh, I think it was Toma Snyder, a very eventually famous physicist, and I were delegated to go up there and get some uranium metal. And it turned out it was finely divided, and it, when exposed to air, spontaneously caught fire. It was under a blanket of CO2, and we were given our metal in a container in a, and in a big bucket wash bucket loaded with slabs of dry ice and I was in the passenger seat with this thing between my legs and my instructions were that if anything caught fire to open the door and kick it out and uh, <clears throat> nothing caught fire we got to Princeton and took it into my lab so on the ground floor with a door out onto the lawn and we opened that door and then opened the can of uranium and it immediately caught fire and we tossed the whole thing out in the lawn and it burned down into the lawn about a foot. And uh, so far as I know, it's still there. We covered it over. And uh, we needed another source of metal. We couldn't use that, obviously. And I was assigned the job of finding out where we could get it, and I did some research and discovered they had made uranium metal for lamp filaments just not very far away at Bloomfield, New Jersey. Westinghouse was trying out every kind of element that you could possibly make a lamp filament out of, and uranium was one of them. And the people who'd made it were still there. They had a patent on it, and we went up and uh, told them we needed a kilogram. I, my God, you know, that's a lot more than a lamp filament. <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, maybe we could do that. Uh, when do you need it? Next month, you know. And now that's impossible. So they had to explain to the White House, it turned out, why that was impossible. So they decided it was possible. And, uh, <clears throat> Sure enough, they put everybody to work on it. And they delivered the right amount of pure metallic uranium, cast the way we wanted it. It was the beginning of a major industry for them because they then became major suppliers. They were the people that understood how to make pure uranium metal. And uh, they suddenly discovered that it was one of their major wartime activities. And... Uh, that was the beginning of source of supply that never stopped. It was critical to the uh, effort. There were lots of things like that. Everything we did was being done for the first time, so <laughs> that's all historic. You mentioned Kellex. Hmm? You Kellex. mentioned Kellex. Did you ever <clears throat> know or know of Dobie Percival? Who? Uh, the man who headed the Kellex. No, I dealt with Dunning. Dunning was their principal scientific advisor, the guy who suggested that gaseous diffusion was the way to go. Of course, they then had to invent the barriers and all the plumbing and so forth because UF6 is that nice to work with. Uh, <clears throat> but I worked with Dunning, and... Uh, he thought originally I might work with Kellex, but then he decided I would fit into his group, which, as I say, was full of really great people. And so that was much, to me, working at Columbia was much better. And I learned there about neutron time of flight, which means that if you have neutrons of various energies made in a pulse at a cyclotron, you can sort out their energies by letting them fly down a vacuum tube. The fastest, the most energetic ones arrive first, the slowest ones arrive last. So you sort them out by time, and you can find out what the properties are of neutrons at given energies by keeping track of when they arrive. I use that later with bombs, 
we let the bomb, neutrons from the bomb, come down tube just the same way, except now, instead of arriving one neutron at a time, they arrived many millions of neutrons at a time, and you could do things with them that you couldn't possibly do with a cyclotron. And uh, so I became famous for inventing the so-called wheel, and, uh, which we captured the neutrons in a metal wheel, which, which uh, revolved in front of a slit as the neutrons arrived they would be captured in this metal, each in its energy range, so that they were separated on the metal by neutron energy, and we were able to measure the fission properties of individual resonances in uranium-235, which never had been done before except by instrumentation. We did it in ways that produced new information. That stuff's written up in the literature. It's, uh, um, something brand new. My colleague at that time was Tony Turkovich, who died last year. He was my constant colleague and friend, professor at the University of Chicago. Tony was one of the original big contributors to the Dunning program, the gaseous diffusion. He worked for Kellex eventually. Came to Chicago and then went to Los Alamos and was present at the original test. He's also a good friend, as was a good friend of mine, Nick Metropolis, who invented, was one of the inventors of the Monte Carlo method and is frequently mentioned as the most cited author in the uh, scientific literature because everybody uses the Monte Carlo method. They always refer to it as Metropolis et al. And, uh, so I should mention maybe that one of the great things in the post-war era was uh, the Theoretical Division Poker Club. I was not a member of Theoretical Division, but I was a member of the weekly poker group, and uh, it had traveling guests. Edward Teller played, Johnny von Neumann played. Uh, it was uh, just about everybody that came by that was willing to play poker would be invited to play in that poker game. So it was more of a social occasion. <clears throat> Stan Ulam, of course, was one of the players. Nick Metropolis, Jim Tuck, and uh, Carson Mark was the... Uh, captain and leader of the thing. And so many of my memories of that time are associated with <laughs> the great nights we spent playing poker. Um, I think I... Re oh, the wartime, the attitude toward the test, uh, the uh, atomic bomb test. All the scientists that I knew of were for a demonstration the fact that they were for a demonstration was not transmitted to Truman. He was working as the brand new president at the time, didn't know beans about, I think, about the bomb project. He turned it all over to the Secretary of War, Stimson, and it was run from the War Department. And uh, they weren't listening, taking advice about demonstrations. They were going to demonstrate that thing over a Japanese city, and that's the way it went. So I don't think that the opinions of the scientists mattered one way or the other. They just never were transmitted. They never were taken seriously. And looking back at it, scientists aren't qualified politicians. and. Uh, in the 80s, when I started the Santa Fe Institute, it was because I was supposedly on the White House Science Council giving advice to Mr. Reagan. I realized that scientists don't give advice to politicians. They help support their policies. And uh, <clears throat> if they don't support their policies, it uh, doesn't matter. 
at that time, the, one of the big issues was whether or not space platforms should be manned or robotic, and White House Science Council voted unanimously for robots. Mr. Reagan said, in effect, Congress would never pass that program unless there were people on it. So policy was political, and uh, that's what determined the fact that we have manned space missions. I think I'm through telling war stories. Well, you've been great. This has been fabulous. You've done a great job, and, and uh, a lot of this is going to be very useful, and I think your point is very well taken that, you know, we have not, that draft does not speak to what the work that was done in Chicago and you know, Well, you know, Glenn Seaborg, after all, went on to become first chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, right. Nobel Prize winner. Right. He and Art Wall invented plutonium, and uh, I don't think you mentioned yeah, his name. Be, uh, I don't think you mentioned him by name. He was unpopular. He uh, um, and was persona non grata at Los Alamos. Art Wall was here. He was Glenn Seaborg's collaborator as a graduate student. By the way, Art Wall is still here. He came back from University of Washington. No, Washington University, St. Louis. And he's an old man now. I don't know whether you want to talk to him. He's bent over and more or less crippled, but he's one of the co-discoverers of plutonium. He and Glenn Seaborg are the co-discoverers of plutonium. Uh, and so they, in a sense, were the beginning of the whole plutonium program. It's really, I think, going to be... Fascinating. Most people have realized that so much of the seminal events, the discovery of plutonium, the discovery of fission, all happened within just a couple of years or yeah. even months before yeah. this whole project. Yeah, the discovery of fission was in 38, discovery of plutonium in 39 or 40. Uh, the first successful bomb was in 45. The whole thing was telescoped into period of time, which if you tried to do it now, you'd have to invent a war or any, some overwhelming threat which would drive those people together, I mean similarly competent people together. Usually every one of them will be running his own show, have his own, own corporate activity in effect, his own funding, his own ability to do anything and go anywhere. Putting them together in an enterprise like was represented at Los Alamos or another star group at, at uh, the Met Lab at the University of Chicago. Uh, it takes an external pressure, and uh, the moment that pressure is relieved, uh, things go back to a different style, and what we did in those few years would if you were to do it in the other style, it would probably take two decades anyway. Uh, of course, the fact that we had an overwhelming priority on everything, you could get whatever you needed, whatever resources you needed, including people by name, and that makes a difference. If you can name a hundred people by name and get them involved, and it's the right list of 100 people. You don't need a large enterprise. <laughs> you, you can get all the support from that center that's needed by picking up a phone. But putting the right people together makes impossible things happen. Well, that is, is that what you deal. tried to do with the, uh, with the Santa Fe Institute? Was mm -hmm. that is that what you try to do with the Santa Fe Institute? Was sort of get, my get uh, my mission with the Santa Fe Institute was to get the kinds of people I knew who knew how to get things done involved in social and political science where people gesture and shout at each other and march around in circles. At least that was my impression. And... Uh, 
there's still people gesturing and shouting at each other and marching around in circles. So I guess we didn't change the world, <laughs> but uh, that sure. was the, that was the general notion. Church, I can't remember exactly.